James Bach extended Hazop's style analysis to testing in a more complex way than you'll see in the academic papers. As with traditional Hazop's, part of the analysis involves identifying the components of the system. Bach calls these product elements. For example, all the program's features are product elements, and so are all the variables, and so are all the error messages. Bach also listed design objectives, which he calls quality criteria. So for example, usability is a quality criterion. Now you could walk through the list of features and ask for each one, how usable is it? And what would unusability look like for this kind of feature? As a third dimension, Bach characterized the project context. For example, the skills of the test team are part of the context. If the testers know a lot about this kind of application, they can test it differently from testers who know a lot about programming, but nothing about this type of application. He called this list the project environment. Box lists are more detailed than a traditional HazOps list. His lists are structured in three tiers. The top level is the type of list, for example, product elements. The next level is the type of element. For example, the product elements list includes structures. And structures refers to everything that's part of the physical product. Now the specific parts of the physical product are subclasses of structures, like code, interfaces, and non-executable files. Here are the classes within the project environment. Here are the classes of product elements, and here are the quality criteria. Bach's use of guide words was inspired by Hazoff's, but he uses them a bit differently. It starts with his lists being a little more complex than you find in the typical set of Hazoff's guide words. He can do that because his lists aren't designed for applying every guide word to every component. For example, consider performance, and by that I mean product speed. You can't actually test every product element for performance. Then you might test every feature for performance, but try testing the manual for performance. The concept just doesn't apply. You also shouldn't test every quality criterion equally thoroughly with all the others. There is a limit on time. So for example, imagine testing a product upgrade from version 3 to version 4, and imagine that the main design objective of the upgrade is to improve speed. Management considers the speed not so good, but the program's usability is acceptable as it is. Well, on a project like this, I'd consider the performance-related implications and risks of every product element, but I'd spend a lot less time on usability risks. And when he's focused on any particular product element, Bach also treats the other product elements as guide words too. So when you're testing a variable, you can ask what other variables you should test in combination with this one, or what features use this variable. And you can also look at this one element on its own and simply ask how can this go wrong. So in Bach's system, the guide words are heuristics. Not always applicable, but often useful. They're reminders of ideas for analysis, not required activities. We'll come back to this model in the next lecture. HazOps often applies failure mode and effects analysis. This provides another way to create lists of ideas of how the product can fail. And as we'll see soon, guide word structures can provide useful frameworks for organizing the failure mode analysis. A failure mode is a way the program can fail. A list of failure modes collects ways that programs or individual features have failed in the past, plus extrapolations, ways that testers imagine a feature could fail in the future. In the 1980s, I created a list of 480 common types of bugs. These were bugs that had shown up in more than one type of product that I expected to see again in future products. This turned out to be one of the most widely used features of testing computer software. You can find the list at Hong Nguyen's website. Now here's an example of similar work by James Bach. Failure mode lists don't tell you how to test for these problems, but they try to describe the problems clearly enough for an experienced tester to imagine some appropriate tests. Giri Vijay Raghavan and Ajay Jha wrote their master's theses in my lab at Florida Tech. Giri developed a failure mode catalog for e-commerce shopping carts. Ajay developed a more general catalog for mobile applications. To develop their lists, they interviewed experienced testers, hunted bugs in several applications, worked through hundreds of magazine articles and bug reports on the web, and then they each customized Box heuristic test strategy model. They sorted their ideas into the model structure, and then they used the model to suggest additional test ideas. Curie describes how he did this in his paper on bug taxonomies. Now just like Box use of guide words is inspired by HazOps, but not exactly the same. These failure mode catalogs are inspired by failure modes and effects analysis, but the process for generating them isn't quite the same. In traditional failure mode and effects analysis, once you have a list of failure modes, you analyze their potential impacts, the effects of each potential failure. The goal is to prioritize the testing of the failure modes. But in failure modes catalogs, we do a lot less work on effects. 
we prioritize the tests outside the list, not as a core part of the analysis. I created my original bug catalog to help me with four types of tasks. Prioritization wasn't one of them. Let me explain my four uses. The first one was that I wanted a ready collection of test ideas. Sometimes when I test, I find myself doing repetitive, uncreative things. A bug catalog helps me break out of that rut. I could skim the catalog for a potential failure that seemed interesting. Then I try to figure out whether the program could fail that way, and if it could, how I could make it fail that way. That led me to a lot of bugs that I don't think I'd have found any other way. My first bug catalog also helped me structure my work as an exploratory tester. This was back in 1983, when the testing establishment's advice about exploratory testing was, don't do that. So even though the best testers I knew all did a lot of exploratory testing, we had to teach ourselves. There was no published guidance on how to do this kind of work. Testing is about running experiments to learn about the quality of the product. Exploratory testing is about accelerating that learning by continually changing how you test as you learn. I found bug catalogs useful for organizing what I've learned to help me imagine new ways to test. Bach created the heuristic test strategy model to fill the same need. Now the difference between his structure and mine is that his is better. So I've been using Bach's model instead of the testing computer software approach since the late 1990s. And when Ajay and Geary did their analyses, they started from Bach's model too. The course assignment is designed to give you a start on applying Box model in much the same way as I apply it when I test a new program. Another way I used the bug catalog was to audit other people's test plans. My problem was that I had to interface with these test labs who wrote insanely detailed test scripts. Some scripts were for products I'd never worked on, and so I had to come up to speed on the product and on the script in a very short time. Anyone who knows me now knows that I'm impatient with scripted testing. I think it wastes time on tasks that yield very little learning. But back in the 1980s, I was a lot more tolerant of scripted testing. So I wasn't challenging the practice when I reviewed these test plans. I was just trying to understand their coverage. And I found it was surprisingly hard to figure out what was covered and what was missing when I'd worked through these hundreds or thousands of pages of scripted tests. I'd get lost in all these pages of meaningless detail. I created my first draft of my first bug catalog to try to assess these test plans coverage. I'd pick a failure mode from that list, and then I'd figure out whether this program could fail in that way. If so, I'd hunt through the test plan to see whether it had any tests that could expose a bug like this. I found a lot of holes in the test plans that way. Notice that this goes after a type of coverage. Actually, it goes after risk coverage. The fourth way I used bug catalogs was as a training tool for new testers. Working testers through the list exposed them to new ideas about how programs can fail and how to design tests to trigger those failures. And that brings the lecture to project level risks. There's too much in this group to cram into this lecture. So I just want to mention them, explain the underlying concept, and then leave the list for you to read on your own when you have time. So far, we've studied ways to trigger specific individual bugs. Project level risks aren't like that. Project level risks threaten the project as a whole or create an opportunity for a broad class of bugs to appear. Here's an example. Suppose the programmers write part of the program using a tool or a library they've never used before. So their unfamiliarity with the tool is probably going to cause them to make some mistakes. Now, I don't know what bugs the programmers are likely to make in the code, so I don't know what to test for. But I test this part of the program way more carefully than the parts written with tools the programmers knew better. That's a project level risk. The rest of the slides describe a bunch of other project level risks. I hope they help you think of some interesting test ideas.